If you've ever played Minecraft, either for your own personal entertainment or because your kids have been talking about it incessantly and, and begging for you to pick up a controller and play with them, you probably have noticed just how easy it is to get lost in the massive, sometimes literally infinite worlds that are created randomly in the game of Minecraft. And, and if you've played more than once with your kids, there's a pretty good chance that either you or them, mostly because they've watched a million videos on YouTube of how to do it, one of the first things that you usually do is you take an entire stack of 64 blocks and you make a single tower that goes 64 blocks tall. And, and this is used so that the people that you're playing with kind of have a central location where pretty much anywhere you go within reason, you can look back and you can see this massive tower standing so that you don't get lost and, and killed at night by all the mobs that come out and, and want to kill you. And if you're really creative, like I was the 15th time that I played with my boys, you place a bunch of torches on the top of this massive tower so that you can see it at night when you need it the most and you're running for your life trying to get back to that tiny little cave that you had built. Now, in the 11th chapter of Genesis, just after the story of Noah's Ark, and right before we get to the story of Abraham, kind of hidden in the middle of the, the lineage, the many, many, many verses of lineage of Noah's children, there's this tiny little story. It's only nine verses long, and they, they make up four really small paragraphs. And this is a story that you would be forgiven to have missed if you were reading through Genesis on your own, because once you see all of these names and ages and stuff, you just kind of blank out and, and hope that you get to something fun and crazy, which Genesis doesn't disappoint. But my guess is, even if you've missed it in your own reading, you've probably heard of this short little story of nine verses in chapter 11 of Genesis. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. And it goes something like this. At the time when people were all speaking the exact same language, everybody gathered on the plains of Shin uh, Shinar, what we know as Babylonia today, and they were making bricks, possibly for the first time. We don't really know. We're not given a ton of details. But they decided that they were going to build a tower all the way to the sky that would do two things for them. It was going to make them famous and it would keep them from scattering to the ends of the earth and getting lost in this giant world. Now, at that point, God comes down and notices this tower that they're building and apparently was worried that they could do anything that they wanted if they were to complete this tower. And so God decides that that can't happen and so he confuses all of their languages. And in an instant, all of these people get really, really confused because they can't hear or understand each other anymore. And so the people stop building this tower and they scatter throughout the world. Now, the interesting thing is that cultures and civilizations all over our planet have either this exact same story in their histories or something very, very similar to it. Everybody from the ancient Sumerians, which you would kind of expect they would have some version of this, all the way to the Native American tribes, the, the Cherokee, for instance, the Greeks and the Romans, all the way to Nepal and Botswana, and even the islands off the coast of New Guinea have versions of this story in their histories. Really interesting. And because it's such an interesting story, it's one that we usually teach all of our grade school kids as they're going through Sunday school. It's one of the stories that I was taught when I was growing up in the church. But it was one that always left me with a bunch of questions. I didn't really understand what I was supposed to learn from this story because it just didn't really make a whole lot of sense. For instance, some of the questions that a, a 9 or 10 year old Trevor came up with. Why in the world was God so worried that people people that apparently were just now making bricks, why was God so worried that if they finished this tower, they would be able to accomplish anything? Wouldn't that be like a good thing? 
Wouldn't it be nice if they were to go on to do incredible things throughout their history, like, I don't know, land on the moon or, or split the atom, which we did 103 years ago? Isn't that what we should be doing? Is advancing and, and making things better and creating amazing things? That's kind of what Americans do. We make big stuff. And why was building a tall tower a bad thing? I like tall things. I happen to be a tall thing. <laughs> Hold for applause. I've got that in my notes. We have built some unfathomable structures. The tower, the Burj Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates, stands at just over one half mile tall. That's huge, but there's a bigger one currently under construction on the shores of the Red Sea that is apparently slated to be 500 feet taller than that, which would place it at the very point of one kilometer in height. That's amazing. <laughs> the one thing that I was told as, as I was being taught about this story of, of the Tower of Babel that actually started to make sense to me was that it wasn't that they were building this tower and it wasn't that they were working together. It was that they were so prideful, that they were so selfish, maybe, that God saw this and recognized it and had to stop it. The problem with that is, at least now that I'm 39 and I'm looking back on this story being taught to me in, in grade school, is that confusing all of these people and adding all of these different languages didn't fix that problem. At least it didn't for me. My pride and my selfishness are still something that I'm constantly struggling with. In fact, that seems to be the root of all sin and all evil that I have ever come across or read about in my entire life. From my personal opinion, selfishness is the root of sin. And adding a bunch of languages didn't fix the problem. Now, it's been years since I've thought about the Tower of Babel, but this week as I was researching for uh, our time together tonight, I ran across a really interesting paper that took a little bit deeper of a view on the Tower of Babel and, and looked at it from multiple perspectives, and something clicked for me. The, the guy that wrote this article, Dr. Jeffrey Halsclaw, he writes about the Tower of Babel from a much broader historical view, which obviously really caught my attention because I like history. He takes a look at how massive construction projects were undertaken thousands of years ago. Well, pretty much for all of human history, other than the last couple hundred years. They're all done on the backs of slaves, people who had been forced into labor, usually and almost exclusively against their will. And in order to do this, you have to break those people emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. You need to take away their identity. You need to take away their own history of their people. You need to take away their language so that they become nothing more than a mindless, easily replaceable drone. Something that you can order around and use as you see fit to do whatever it is that you want so that you can take from them their freedom and get for yourself fame and wealth. And that was almost certainly the way in which the Tower of Babel would have been made. Now, here's a fascinating paragraph that, that he writes in this article where he says uh, that it's helpful, quote, to think of Babel and the tower that it attempted to build as a forced unity, a forced unity, not chosen, forced unity created by fear and enforced by oppression. Certainly the people wanted to make a name for themselves, pride, but they also feared that they would be, quote, dispersed over the face of the earth, quoting Genesis 11, 4 in the story of the Tower of Babel. But why is this so bad, he asks. 
Why isn't this, isn't this what God desired for humanity when God blessed humanity to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth? Quoting Genesis 1.28. Fear has caused a rebellion against our human vocation to represent God throughout the world. And instead of being representative of God throughout the world, those in Babel wanted to be God in a singular place. And so as he goes on talking about how this would have been created and, and tying, it, tying it in with the biblical story that we're given in Genesis, he, he talks about the, the beauty that was being destroyed. The, the, not, not the beauty of the earth and, and all the pretty mountains and flowers that we usually we think of when we think of beauty, but the beauty in the diversity of humanity. The, the thing that God had created and, and desired for us to go out and, and mark our territory and, and spread throughout the entire earth and be God's representatives in all four corners of the planet. And in doing so, just the incredible diversity that that would naturally bring about. And in enslaving these people and making a singular spot that nobody was allowed to leave from, you were robbing God of the ability to place his image in all of its beauty and diversity across the planet. And I thought that was really fascinating. And so when we think about the Tower of Babel, it's not necessarily a lesson about tall things being bad, thankfully, or that working together is evil. Obviously, it's not. These are a few short nine verses snuggled in this really random spot in Scripture that is a call to remind us that we are to go forth and not just multiply and fill the earth, but to be this beautiful diversity that fully encapsulates the image of God because we ourselves are bearers of the divine image and to force people against their will to conform to something that they have no desire to conform to is a sin against God. And so in order to fix this, not to destroy this temple because it was too tall or, or to stop people from working together, but in order to create the diversity that God was desiring for humanity, God confuses all of their languages and they are forced to scatter throughout the entire world. And now we have all kinds of people and all kinds of cultures, not all good, but far, far more diversity and beauty representing this image that God originally intended for humanity. So, why in the world are we talking about the Tower of Babel tonight? Well, for Christians around the world, today is the day in which we celebrate Pentecost. Fifty days after Easter, when the Holy Spirit descends and flows into the upper room and empowers the disciples and the rest of the followers of Jesus with the ability to communicate beyond what they were physically able to do, the Word of God, like it had never gone out before. There's this really regular occurrence between the Old Testament and the New Testament where stories tend to mirror each other and play off of each other and oftentimes contradict each other from the fall of Adam and Eve to the redemption in Revelation. You see this really interesting arc in human history that's at the pinnacle begins to be redeemed at Easter. And Pentecost seems to really line up well with the Tower of Babel. And so tonight I, I kind of wanted to put these two stories together and show how God worked in both of these situations to do very different things but very God-like things. So, if you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, tonight we are going to be talking about Pentecost. This retelling of the moment when the Holy Spirit arrives on the scene, fills the upper room, and empowers the disciples to do things that they were not prepared to do. Now, as you're looking through your Bible for Acts chapter 2, uh, I want to remind you that, that Pentecost is actually also a, a Jewish celebration that happens 49 days um, after the second day of Passover, and uh, it, it's called, at least in English, the Feast of Weeks. 
or Shabbat. And Jews from all over the world gather in Israel, most of them in Jerusalem, to celebrate the, the wheat harvest, right? It, it, it's kind of the celebration of the wheat harvest and also the giving of the Torah to Moses. So all of the followers of Jesus are gathered in the upper room and they are praying. And they're kind of waiting for God to do something. It, it's been a while since the crucifixion and the, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And they're just waiting and they don't really know what to do anymore. Got to find where I'm at in my notes. Moving too fast. This is the very same room, in theory, where Jesus had had his last supper with the disciples, that where he had sat down and he had washed their feet, where they had had Passover meal together, where he had then given them their, uh, their final command to love one another as I have loved you. And so Acts chapter 2 opens with the Spirit of God filling this room and giving this incredible breath of wind, this this storm, so loud, in fact, that people throughout the city hear this and they're really confused and really intrigued and they all rush to the same point where this massive noise is coming from. You have this wind blowing in, you have these, uh, these flames that look like tongues that are kind of dancing on the top of the disciples' heads. Each of these things representing both the Spirit of God, wind, life itself, and the power of God, these these flames, and then obviously tongues, which makes sense. So here in Acts chapter 2, verse 5, we read this. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. These two stories, the Tower of Babel and Pentecost, they play off of each other. In the story of the Tower of Babel, God comes down to see what these people are doing, and he isn't pleased, so he confuses their languages, and then they are dispersed throughout the world. But here in Acts, we end up seeing something very different. Here in Acts, God seems to have gathered all of the people, kind of a reversal He gathers all the people from all over the world, and then they hear their own languages being spoken back to them. Not all the same language being spoken. It's not like they had one common tongue. No, they heard their own languages being spoken after being gathered. You had this reversal of this story. And then in verse 7, it goes on to say, they were completely amazed, as you would expect. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, provinces of Asia, and all of these funny words of places that I've never been, except for Egypt. I've been to Egypt. And the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. They were hearing about the wonderful things that God had done. Not the things that the people were doing, but the wonderful things that God had done. And what you'll notice is that God didn't reverse this idea of this curse of multiple languages. He he didn't undo this curse. He used it. He, He used it in such a fashion that all of a sudden, all of the followers of Jesus are speaking, but they're hearing it in their own languages. All of the languages remained, but what they heard had completely changed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking our own languages. God doesn't seem to be undoing these actions that happened thousands of years ago at the Tower of Babel, where he introduces all these languages and the people scatter. Maybe because he doesn't want the people all coming back and being exactly the same. 
the diversity continues, but the hearing of the word completely changes. Verse 13, we see that guy, because there's always that guy, right? In every single gathering, there's always that guy. And if you don't know who that guy is, it's probably you. You're probably that guy. In verse 13, but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all that it is. And this is where Peter seems to figure out what God is doing and why they were given this incredible gift in the very first place. Verse 14, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and he shouted to the crowd. People gathered from all over the known world, people that would be speaking all kinds of languages that these guys had heard before because this gathering took place every year, but had no idea how to speak. Peter steps forward and shouts to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Now, a couple of things. First of all, did you notice in Peter's response that he didn't say, of course we're not drunk because we never get drunk. No, he didn't say that. He also didn't say, we couldn't possibly be drunk because we never drink. N no. I think one of the reasons this sermon that follows it is so effective is because Peter starts out instantly with just some classic humor. He's just a funny guy, and funny guys, they're my kind of people. He kicks off his speech lightly, addressing the elephant in the room and getting everybody hopefully to laugh or at least roll their eyes in a fashion that it's like, oh gosh, one of those guys. But then he dives into the real reason that they've been given this gift, the real reason that he steps up and begins shouting to this crowd. Verse 16. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And then he goes into a deep and very effective argument, a, a sermon, if you will, probably the second most well-known sermon in all of Christian history, where he goes out and he lays out reason after reason after reason to all of these Jews and Jewish converts onto why Jesus, this man that they had just crucified, just not far from here, 50 some days ago, why he was the Christ, the one that they had been waiting for for centuries, the one that their, their parents and their grandparents had told them about, legends and rumors that one day God was gonna send somebody and it was gonna change everything. And he's like, listen, this was the guy. And you killed him. You killed the one that God sent to you. But the good news is he didn't stay dead. And he tells them of the resurrection. He, he gives them the gospel in their own language, something he never would have been able to do on his own. And at the end of this speech, this sermon, if you will, we're told that 3,000 people are baptized and added to their numbers. 3,000. And at the end of this day, something brand new is started. A, a brand new organization, this brand new entity, was kicked off on the day of Pentecost. Something that had not existed that morning was now taking shape by the end of that day. And in my Bible, this next section is titled, the believers form a community. Here's verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the breaking of bread, or maybe yours says the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and their possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. 
This is the birth of a brand new community of believers. This is the start of what we now call the church. Pentecost is the kickoff moment. It's the moment where something that was not possible before this is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and boom, we're off to the races. The funny thing is that the gospel didn't stay in Jerusalem. It was heard for the first time in a multitude of languages in Jerusalem, but from that day forward, after the Feast of Weeks, these people went back to their hometowns. They went back to their own countries, to their own cultures. They took the gospel with them in their own languages, back to their friends and their families. And they were able to share something that they had heard in their own tongue with their own people. Back to the multitude of diversities from whence they came. And in both of these stories, we see people gathered together in a single spot, and then disperse all across the world. And in both of these stories, we see God at work in very powerful ways. But I think for me, at least, the importance of both of these stories is is not how they're similar, but how they're vastly different. You see, in, in Babel, the people were gathered together because of pride and because of selfishness because of a desire to be famous and to keep everybody together, whether they wanted to be or not. They exploited and they abused each other so that a few of them could get rich and get famous. But in Jerusalem, the apostles were gathered together in selflessness, in self-giving love. They were seeking the will of God. They were waiting for God to do something. They weren't doing it on their own and forcing it to happen. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit. And then they used what they had been given for the benefit of others. Not for their own benefit, although I'm sure they could have made a lot of money on that party trick. But they used it so that everybody that was there would have the ability not only to hear something amazing and be a part of something incredible, but so that they could hear the gospel in their own language, so that their lives, both here on earth earth and in eternity, would be changed for the better. So the question on my mind after reading both of these stories this week is what is it that God has given me that I can use for the betterment of those around me, both now and in eternity? What are the things that I'm trying to force myself when I need to be more patient and wait for the Holy Spirit to work and to move in God's own timing? And are there ways in which I need to scatter out further in my own world, in my own comfort zone, so that the gospel can continue to grow and thrive? Now, when the boys and I play Minecraft together, the first thing that we do is we find the coordinates and we find zero, zero on the map. And then we build this massive tower and we put torches on the top of it so we can all come back together. And usually what we do is we end up building this big village together and everybody builds their own home and, and, you know, we do all the stuff and, and then eventually somebody gets really bored and things start to devolve from there. And then it's, oh man, he broke down my door and well, he stole my stuff and he killed my dog and things just never go really well. And what I found is that when we have a central meeting point and then everybody goes off and explores the world and has their own adventures and maybe they adventure together for a while, but we all come back and share the stories that we've had. We share the the plunder that we've gathered, the, the diamonds and maybe emeralds if we're delving that deep. When we have a central meeting point and a central goal but we get to all have diversity. We all have our own jobs. The boys love giving each other jobs in Minecraft. You're the miner and you're the builder and you're the guy that kills all the mobs. When we all play our part and get to be as diverse as we want to be, but we all have a common goal, things are far, far better, much smoother, and everybody has a much better time. In closing tonight, I want to read to you from John's Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 7. I'm going to start with verse 9. (sighs) 
After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count. People from every nation and every tribe, and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all of the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings, and they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. And they sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen.